though, can I talk about um, something that's been grinding my gears the last week or two? Yeah. Yeah, just to start it off, because this is a very, I think this is going to be a very positive episode, generally. For sure. Um, yeah, let's get some negative. Let's really front load the negativity. Let's, get some, let's balance it out. The vinegar to the honey of this episode is... <laughs> the salty to the sweet, baby. It, 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 it'll date this episode a little bit, but like, every year, I fall for watching the Game Awards. Mm -hmm. Okay. And... I know, I know what it is. It's just a big ad campaign. Mm -hmm. It is Jeff Keeley, the Dorito Pope, uh, <laughs> who uh, I, I don't know why I can't stand the guy other than I feel like it was just game trailers and G4 was closing down and he was like, well, I'm out of work. You know, we should do an award show to honor games and maybe I just host it. And like ever since then, it's been years now of this. We should be like the Oscars. Chad, we should be in a big award show. Please tell me that you came up with the name D the Dorito Pope. No, you don't know about Dorito Pope. It's a whole meme. It's a whole. No, whole I don't know. I never. Uh, I'm not on the internet. I don't know that. I don't know what that is. <laughs> uh, Jeff Keeley. Uh, I listen. I think there's a lot of games journalism. Like you guys are just. You, you guys are just car salesmen. You're not doing any like. You're not. You're not watergating this shit. No, um no and jeff Keeley is like well, you're just a tv presenter that's fine that's that's a that's a job ryan seacrest is that right yeah i think he knows what he is and i think that the show even knows what it is i i'm under no suspicions that people think that this is a, a moment of high art in any way i think like i mean i was actually i don't watch the game awards but i was excited that they were happening because i was like oh cool a ton of new stuff will be announced it's just like another e3 right well now it's e3 yeah especially because e3 like collapsed Mm -hmm. Like, Game Awards was, like, kind of perfectly placed to just take over it, for sure. Mm -hmm. And I, you're right. I, I guess when I watch it, there's a lot of, like, we're here to honor games. And, like, and this is about positive place. And, like, and, and Jeff started the award show off this year not bragging about his friend Hideo Kojima like he always does. But instead, like, you know, I got to say this is a place where, where, where everyone's safe and respected. I.e. talking about how, like, five of the biggest game companies right now are all, like, coming out to be turned to be monster companies mm -hmm. that are just mm -hmm. destroying souls. Mm -hmm. But then there's, like, no naming of stuff. There's no, like, there's no calling them out. There's never be like, Blizzard, we're talking about you. Those are the it's, money people. They can't make, they can't talk about the, the money, money people. people. And then it's like, all right, now let's cut to an ad from Ubisoft, which is, like, a, one of those companies. And then it's like, uh, uh, I don't know. It just drives me up the fucking wall. I mean. This isn't funny. I'm just mad. And I'm going to show you Doritos <laughs> Pope, Paul. Yeah, I never heard of this. <laughs> Kevin, I know you want to, I know you want to chime in on this. I, I also don't watch the Game Awards. Um. I don't know where they're on Spike TV, right? Like you need like fucking cable or something. <laughs> is it even on TV <laughs> anymore? TV even, well, Spike TV became G4. I don't even know anymore. Spike just keeps getting re resurrected as a different company. So, so I don't even know where you'd go to watch the game. Awards I watched it I, on Twitch. All right. Well, I guess that makes sense. Um, <laughs> but like the problem with all award shows is it's just a place to buy an award for your thing to get some last sure, minute marketing sure. in for your yes. stuff. Like it's it's not a, an expression of merit <laughs> when it, when they're this high production. It doesn't frustrate me that like games didn't have an award show and now we have a crappy award show. It's, <laughs> a, awards are bad. <laughs> if I'm being honest, an award ceremony is a cementing of the narrative that an industry tells about itself. Yeah, that's all it is. Sure, yes, and like yes. like the movie awards are like. We're always about like, look at the great artistry we've completed. And it was just, you know, reinforcing the, what the big studios did. Essentially, they would occasionally pick out a little little indie to throw a bone to here and there. Right. Right. Which was, the you know, one of the many indie studios owned by the giant studios through subsidiaries. Yeah. Right. Uh, and then like yeah. and now and now like those same apparatuses are being used to be like, look how look how aware of social issues we are but we just changed that in the last three years but we did it look at us you know it's like that's all sure those. sure and I, I feel like i mean i don't know i didn't i don't watch the game awards so i would assume that they're going in that same direction let's do our own game awards all right okay Ooh. okay Ooh, i like this no sponsors mm -hmm, uh mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this is 100 percent our opinion <laughs> what was a pretty good game that you played this year and they all get awards. They all yeah. get awards. Well, the game uh, it's it's been it's been over a year that we've been playing it, but the game that has that has held us together throughout this hellish past couple of years has been yeah. 
has been dwarfs, as we call it. Deep Rock Galactic wins yeah. award for mm-hmm. game that is always available. <laughs> game that is always there for <laughs> Old, you. Old, reliable. Thanks for thanks for being there. Warm blanket. Deep Rock Galactic. It's it's always there and it's always pretty good. Like mm-hmm. I always have a great time playing with you guys. I have a great time playing it solo. Every couple of months, there's like a really cool up date for it like you if y- y- y'all listening so uh we're not gonna get into the, all the mechanics of deep rock galactic but it is just you work for a space mining company where you are a bunch of dwarves and you have mm-hmm. different skills like driller or scout or uh, uh engineer and you go into these missions that are kind of randomized a little bit and find minerals and get out of there before you die and kevin mm-hmm. is like our boss dad in this. <laughs> Kevin is the foreman of our group. Yeah. Like, you know, if we if we're if we prestiged one time, Kevin has ten prestige levels <laughs> and is just like, all right, there's the egg there. There's the egg there. Oh, oh, okay. Who awakened the who awakened the uh crystal? Oh, nope. All right. All right, I guess we're doing I this. I guess now. yeah, I guess we're doing we're that. Like, I guess we're killing this now. And I'm okay. like, Daddy Kevin, I found Nitra. <laughs> what do I do with it? I'm proud of Chad every time uh, I'm like, where's Chad? <laughs> and then I hear drilling in the distance and he suddenly pops up like a mole right underneath. Be like, what? Oh, it's I so wasn't... fun to with do. A, with, a giant, <laughs> with a giant gem in his hands. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wasn't halfway across the world. <laughs> no, I made it to you. Uh, that that game is great. It, it, Paul, is that, your, is that your game award of the year? Uh, I guess if, if I had to pick a new game, I, I don't play tons of games, but if I had to pick a newer game that I just played this year, Kevin, yes. you introduced yes. us to Elekhead. Which, Elekhead is probably my game of the year. That game was so Damn. joyous and small. And Chad, I think I know what your game is going to be. And I would. You think so? That's a, yeah. That is a close second for me. I haven't finished it yet. But I got to say that I like this because it's short and sweet. And it constantly made me giggle with how inventive it was. Leckhead was fantastic. Yeah. You know what I really found interesting about Leckhead is there is no text in that game apart from the title. Yeah. That's cool. Everything is done with the language of games. Yep. It's a platform where your body conveys electrical currents that changes mm-hmm. the platforms, right? Yep. You're, well, you're, your head does. And you can throw your oh, head. Yes. And uh, and move your body around for a little bit after you throw your head. And that's like the only mechanic. Like that's the only upgrade in the game. Mm-hmm. Like you're like, you get that pretty early on. And you're like, cool, I can throw my head. Well, I wonder what the next upgrade is going to be. There isn't one. <laughs> he just like finds new ways to. <laughs> that's all you get. You have an electrical head and we <laughs> and we deviate off of this. Yeah, that one's that one's great. And Kevin, to your point, it's, it's made by a Japanese developer um, mm-hmm. and it is super impressive. I don't know, uh, you know, what languages the developer speaks, but the fact that the, the developer made this game, uh, you know, language free is really cool because it just, it shows you like kind of the power of video games, right? That there's like, you can create this mm-hmm. universal experience through just symbols. It's like a silent movie almost. All right. One of the, one of the awards, the Goosebuds game awards goes to Elec Head. Yep. Uh, this mine's gonna be tough. It's a pretty dead even split between Psychonauts two, which was near perfect, mm-hmm. and the one I just am coming off of right now. So I'm writing that high of Inscription. Boy, is Inscription neat. Oh yeah. I, I so I've been playing Inscription as well. And Chad, you and I have been having a a running dialogue as we go through that game. There's so many. Yeah, like Kevin, if you ever play, I'd be really curious. Your thought. There's so many fun little. Um, it's one of those games where it's like you don't want to read up too much because it'll spoil things that happen in it. And you know what? You know what though, Chad? Like, and I haven't beaten it, so I you know I can't speak too much to yeah. the ending. But I don't even think that's that important for this game. Like, hmm. the, no, that's true. Like, I don't. Find, I, the story was is really nice, and like it's a good little story and everything like that. But I ultimately do not think that the the twists and the turns that the game goes in are really what makes it entertaining. The fucking true, the fucking true. card game at the heart of this is a fucking blast to play. The mechanics are so solid. Yeah, you and I were talking about how we just wish we could just play a kind of persistent version of that card game. It's a original card game nested in a you're finding this old video game based on a, on a card game, physical card game, and. But you're also in an escape room of this guy's cabin, and he's making you play cards with him and solving puzzles in the escape room or giving you more cards. Mm -hmm. Uh, It sounds like a vacation with me. (laughs) I will make you play card games with me. Kevin. (laughs) Kevin. You lock them away and you go, Kevin, this is so, you are so leshy, Kevin. (laughs) Kevin is leshy. Kevin, Kevin, this is like Misery X Kevin is what this would be. Like if we we crossovered that movie with your life, that's what this game would be. (laughs) 
You're because like Leshy's also playing. You're kind of playing like a card like art tabletop game because you're mm -hmm. moving across this map, and then Leshy is like he's your he's your other player, but he's like putting on masks to be other characters, yep, DMing it, and he's getting really into the lore. And it's very much a great game of pretend friends with Kevin, where Kevin's like, "All right, Chooch is up now, and now and now we're hanging out with Chooch for a little bit." Love hanging out, with Chooch. This is Chooch yeah. wherever you are. <laughs> <laughs> in the void of Kevin's mind. <laughs> I've been meaning to check out that game. Like everyone on, on my Twitter feed has been talking about it, but like in sort of hushed tones, like they don't want to spoil anything. It's more than just a doki doki where you're like, oh, that was a cool idea. There's there's genuinely some fun it's, mechanics. It's a it. really fun card game. Kevin, you'd love it. It's very magic, uh, you know, like very like based off of magic, but then it brings in some of those Hearthstone elements. Like and I love like, the, I don't even want to like spoil it, but like they bring in like different different resources you know for like playing oh, your cards yeah. oh, and man. like it's it's really every time they add a new layer of complexity to the to the cards you're like oh well this is just too much this is just too many like i was happy with what the cards were and then you start playing it when you're like oh no now the strategies <laughs> have multiplied and i'm having a good time figuring out what i like to play what car kind of cards Ooh. i like to play if, imagine if there was five heads of magic the gathering each color you know covering a different color and they were kind of internally infighting over what the mechanics should be too if that makes sense mm -hmm. like 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 one being like no i think it should be more about like counter magic or okay. i think it should be more like about buffing your cards and it's really fun to see almost like competing game designs that actually synergize very well together hmm. um this this is becoming a Camp Goosebuds episode. Kevin, what's your game of the, what's your Goosebuds game award go to? Uh, I'm just looking at my Steam library to see if there's any other games I really like this year. Um, I still love Pyre. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Kevin. Oh, uh, maybe maybe this is the year we finally start chatting. Kevin play Pyre only uh, yeah. YouTube channel. <laughs> yeah. Maybe this is it. I mean, the channel exists. The channel's set. I made it. You can't get it, anyone listening. It's locked in. It's just waiting. Like, chooch in the void, just waiting for <laughs> time to come out. Um, speaking of, you know, resolutions and things to do in the new year. Oh, boy. Yeah. Y'all nice. want to talk about this fa fantastic episode of Pete and Pete. Nice fucking job, Chad. Okay. I am continuously proud of Pete and Pete. Just, it's such a good show. And I, yeah. I I can't describe it as any other way. Like, I'm just, like, so happy the show exists. Yeah, I haven't seen a bad one yet as a kid or as an adult. Um, we we watched New Year's Pete uh, as we approached the end of 2021. If you, if you would like to watch the episode, if you're starting this episode of Goosebuds Up and you would like to... Uh, well, by the way, welcome to Goosebuds. Welcome to Goosebuds. I'm Paul. I'm Chad. I'm Kevin. And if you want to watch this episode before we start discussing it, you can find it on a certain video watching site that is very popular <laughs> around the world. Just give it a search. I don't want to yeah. blow its spot up because I don't want it taken away from me. As I often say, there's nothing illegal about typing something into a YouTube search box. The illegal part has been taken care of for you. You might as well benefit from that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> vaults, vaults open. Grab some money. I believe this is... This is either season one or not part of, like, a typical season. This de uh, debuted in December of 1992. We're coming up on 10... Or, sorry, my God, I must said 10 years. We're coming up on <laughs> 30 years since this came out. Oh, my God. That's weird to think about. Uh, yeah. Okay. This this one has so many bits in it that I had forgotten was from this episode, but have been in my, my head this whole time. The... The bowling ball with a little gerbil inside that can control the bowling ball as long as you have telepathic signals is... Yeah. I think I forgot it came from this, but I'm always thinking about what if a gerbil's in a bowling ball because of this show. Or or just tapped into sort of like a kid-like mentality of, I'm new here, but I think I can work the rules of this right. plane to my advantage. Right. All I need is a bowling ball and a gerbil. Uh -huh. I mean, so this show is... Typically, Pete and Pete is divide, divided into two kind of stories, a Pete, an old Pete story yeah. or a young Pete story. And this episode yeah. is a young Pete story. Yeah. I, and, and I yeah. did look it up. This is uh, technically outside of the Pete season canon, I guess. This is oh, uh, oh. this is a special. So it's a, technically a season zero episode. Okay. 
Okay. Is that because it says it, it at least in terms of this episode, it establishes that Artie goes off to become a famous bowling legend? <laughs> yeah, and that's never really resolved. <laughs> oh wait, wait, wait. Yeah. So is this the fi- okay. is this the final episode of the of the show? No. Before they Maybe. made season one, they made a bunch of different specials. I see. Okay. Nickelodeon didn't want to commit to a whole season. Yeah, I guess this could kind of exist on its own. You don't really need to know. Like, it's not getting into mom's got a plate in her head and right. Pete, you know, young little Pete's got a, a tattoo that he talks to. This is just a boy with a dream. Uh huh. Okay. So, as we said, this is a little Pete episode. Uh, we begin, little Pete is biking uphill, remembering what a terrible year it's been as mm-hmm. the adult in his life uh, suck down cocktail wieners. Which people don't make cocktail wieners anymore, and that's fucked up. They don't. They guys, don't. Gotta, guys gotta come to my parents' house. We do a damn fine cocktail wiener. Damn. Oh my god, I would love to have spent New Year's at, at the Cole house. They figured out how to wrap pastry around cocktail wieners, and everything became pigs in a blanket, and cocktail wieners uh, lost listen, their way. I, 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 you'd rather have a cocktail wiener than a pig in a blanket? Pig in a blanket is the perfect They're great. The superior they are, they are great, sure. but... I'm oh, okay. I, yeah, we make pigs in a blanket. You, you're you saying oh. that a pure... A pure wiener. Paul wants a circumcised <laughs> cocktail Yes. Wiener. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I get the tiny hot dog thing. That's just extra casing. <laughs> That's the best part is that skin. <laughs> if you've had a good Berkshire pork sausage, you know that they're the pinnacle. This episode of the Game Awards is brought to you by... <laughs> Little cocktail doggies. I love I love all the big close up shots of um, Dad sucking down a cocktail. Sucking <laughs> down wieners. They added a slurping sound effect for sure. Lots of smoking in this episode. We get we get a little shot of right. Frank, uh, Frank the crossing guard, uh, smoking a cigarette, saying this is the year he'll quit. Yep, multiple scenes of of smoking, which is was surprising. I saw the first one and I was like, okay, we got some smoking. That, could, but it's thematic, or not thematic. It's it's plot based, so it you know it like it's needed for the plot, but. Yeah, they, they never they never portrayed as something glamorous. Or anything they make like it that. look not cool in this in this episode. It's for a sure. thing. It's a thing he's trying. Is is it Frank the Frank, crossing guard? Yeah, yeah Frank. It, it is Pete showing like all the adults making these fake New Year's resolutions that are not going to go anywhere, and Frank the crossing guard lonely talking about how he is going to quit smoking this year. It's a very cliche resolution, but you're right. I was also like, oh yeah, that that guy is just full on lighting a cigarette and. And puffing it up, and that is a repeatable behavior for kids to watch. Yes, it it's is. Kind of, kind of badass that it's in this. Not sure how it got past S and P, but but that's cool. It was a different time. Yeah, <laughs> but time it, in the nineties. It's it, it's it was a fact of life. Like adults smoke. Like that's that's kind of yeah. where they were coming from. There, Little Pete wants to change the world in unspecified ways. Uh, he just knows that. <laughs> If he had a Riley retrofired jetpack, he could be anywhere and right. change the world. I tried to write some of these down because I thought they were pretty great. They are, you know, his his ambition is limitless, Kevin. You're right. Yeah. I enjoyed that a few of them in- involved that if he could buy this jetpack from a magazine, that was only $456.98. That is a fucking steal. That is a million. But, a but when you were when you were a like 10 year old child, that is a million dollars. That's a and lot I'll- of money. But that's also, like a Power Wheels. Also, let's adjust for inflation. That was uh, $456.98 in... 92. So, probably more like $700 now. It's a big expense. Pro- pro- probably $2,000, honestly. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready to quadruple that. I, I, I can understand as a kid that's an impossible amount of money. But it's enough for, for Little Pete and Big Pete to, to, to hustle culture uh, <laughs> their way into earning that jetpack. Yes. And Pete definitely has... Uh, plans and involving, I believe he said he would go over to China and establish peace. Peking, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He has plans about where he's going to make his road pit stops around the world. Yeah. He, and he, he's constantly He would be the them. rocketeer. Yes, yes. He's going to constantly drop in on different heads of state and talk with them and, and figure things out. I do want to say this, that this is the beginning of this episode is dealing with New Year's. And New Year's is typically when we take stock of our lives and decide, you know, hey, I didn't quite achieve all the things I wanted to achieve this year, but I, you know, it's a brand new year and I'm going to go into it with a full head of steam and I'm going to make make the best of it and change things. And and Pete, being a young child full of uh, idealism, uh, thinks that his parents and the and the adults around him do not uh, aren't thinking big enough. Right. Their yeah. their mm-hmm. their ideas are small scale and a little selfish. And he says we can fix the world. He's being idyllic right now. 
Yeah. And I think that that's a really important through line to remember through this episode because I think the, we'll go back and we'll we'll hit the themes later, but I think this does a great job of taking Pete on the journey through that idealism and maybe arriving back at it in it with a new perspective by the end. Yes. I yeah. like how we see the decline of little Pete in this episode because at the at the start of this we're kind of with him where where we're like I don't know why he's so like dejected about the new year but you know he's trying to make the world a better place you know whatever you need to do to make that happen sure do it it's a little uh a, it's a wonderful life where he's standing at the top of a hill yes. with his bike and he calls him <laughs> he refers to himself as a pathetic blowhole and yep. he also says the only thing i changed this year was my underpants <laughs> <laughs> the dra- the drama behind that delivery is what really sells. It really is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. it's really earnest. Uh, also, I think it's because of this. I lo- it's uh, I think it's one of the only episodes that Little Pete narrates even the whole episode. Maybe because it was one of the early specials and they were figuring that out. But yeah, yeah, Big yeah. Pete is very is is very not present in this. He's just helping his little brother out a couple times. The tenor of this episode is actually more of an older Pete episode. I don't know if you guys would agree with that, but I think that the yeah. the contemplative mm. and sort of like loss of innocence uh, episodes are a little bit more old Pete style. And I find it really interesting that we get this young Pete who, Kevin, to your point earlier, is typically the child who, you know, is coming at it with this child power fantasy mm-hmm. approach. And this is a kind of a blending of the two uh, points of view, this episode. Yeah, I was thinking about that. There was a moment, you know, and not to jump around too much. This is kind of like, it is Pete, little Pete telling about the, the moments of the past year and why he's so bitter, right? You're kind of bookending the show with present day, New Year's Eve in this current year. But there there was a moment when uh, one of the kind of the, the peaks of the episode is little Pete having this big st- stare down with frank the crossing mm-hmm. guard who won't let him go and i thought it was really int- i i did think it was an interesting blending of the Pete's and that little pete the rebel that will grow to love is very much like fuck you i will i will stay here all night literally all night until the morning i'm supposed to be delivering papers now i'm gonna be delivering papers at a day old uh because i because fuck the man mm-hmm. and then also simultaneously he is wanting to be a force for good and that feels more like old Pete. Right. Of like this kind of like natural justice almost feels more like him. Well, we get we get an even more unreliable narrator in Lil Pete. Maybe like this is how he's justifying the jetpack to himself. Like he could do all these good things, but what he really wants is freedom, right? Like he wants to be able to do good things. And he feels like with his current tool set, uh, he can only aspire to do good. He d- He doesn't know yet that like, there are ways he can change the world without a jetpack. Right. And he's and he's also, in addition to like freedom, he feels constrained by the system of which he views Crossing Guard Frank to be a agent of the system. Mm-hmm. You know, and he mm-hmm. sees he sees in him at the beginning an uncaring, cold uh product of the system that's holding him back, not a human being, right? Right. Sure. <laughs> but in the many griffs that uh little Pete undergoes to get the money to buy the Riley retrofired jetpack. The first one is maybe my favorite, which is door to door landmine scans. It's Fan- fantastic bit. It's fantastic bit. Beautiful. And the taking it full advantage of the beautiful uh homes and architecture of, of central north central New Jersey here mm-hmm. showing off so that, I don't know about you guys, but I see these things again. And we talked about it. This is like you look at it and you're like, this is the beautiful childhood that I remember <laughs> when you look at these houses. <laughs> they are they are nail they are nailing the peaceful, maybe naive quiet of the nineties suburbs. Yes, for sure. Without a um, doubt. And I, I thought it was so it, the entire bit and I love the big Pete's on board too. Um yep. I don't think he has he has a goal necessarily what he's saying every kid needs money. And, you know, they're like, they put on big hazmat suits and metal detectors <laughs> and are just doing, it would be a cute bit by itself of just offering to do land, you know, landmine sweeping for people. Mm-hmm. And you see the first old lady is like, I am not interested. Yeah. But lo and behold, <laughs> the Pete's are smart businessmen and they have planted uh, ahead of time a landmine. Don't ask where they got it. <laughs> Uh, in the yard and demonstrate by blowing up an action figure also in a hazmat suit showing this could happen to you. Or us. Yeah. Scaring people into ordering cleanup. Yeah. And it works. And it works. And it shows how, like, you know, 
capitalism is in the 90s kid blood like and well that kevin (laughs) kevin that's the thing right capitalism and that's what pete's like his idealism to change the world is ultimately already corrupted by capitalism by his need to purchase the what was it called what was the exact name of the backpack the riley retro fired jet the riley retro fired jet pack it's already it also yeah it also had some merciful engines which is probably just tech jargon but it's like does that mean that that fucking bitch can go on oh yeah that's pretty good oh yeah it does this uh this whole like plot it seems like very capitalist but it really shows you like capitalism tries to sell you a thing that you don't need by making you think that you're helpless without it yes Mm -hmm. sure this was this was the moon shoes for me right the nickelodeon (laughs) moon speaking of nickelodeon this was the like if you just had these expensive things your life would be so much you will jump to your friend's house Uh, the second, the second lamb. I just want to call out Debbie the, Harry. The, they they show a quick montage. Yes, yeah, Debbie Harry from Blondie is just having <laughs> fun in this show. Yep. Like like one. I would say unless I don't know some dark history about Blondie, Debbie Harry seems like one of the coolest rockers of all time just in terms of her career and what she's done. And I didn't even recognize her that she's dressed up in like a bathrobe, and I don't even know what you'd call that. Kind of like she's at the hair hair salon. She's got like that. That like sixties mod look kind of going, like that extremely, extremely perfected sixties look. Yeah, they considered putting like uh like a cake mask on her face, probably in the <laughs> type of character she is. And she is and she is not enjoying it uh until her the pitch until her little dog steps on a landmine <laughs> is totally fine. Uh, <laughs> totally fine. Um, and then uh, after they the the house the explosion at uh, Debbie Harry's house, they go to yep. a third a third house. And they're trying to run their grift. They have the the mine planted, and Ellen comes running up. And old Pete sees that she's about to step onto the landmine, thus uh, becoming gravely injured or killed. And he <laughs> runs out and bravely dives and stops her. Yeah, Pete, little Pete says he was sucker punched by puberty. He blames his glands, his glands. for taking his brother from him. Yeah. The, the shot of the glands was really it cuts like a medical diagram including one that i didn't know was a real thing one of the bottom of the mark i thought was a joke was called the islands of langarens <laughs> I, I was like that must just be a silly silly bit i guess that's a real thing in your body like a gland like a i looked it up. i didn't it see that like chat i love that yeah uh the islets of langarens are a cluster of cells within the pancreas that are responsible for the production and release of hormones that regulate glucose levels so that's a real scientific thing that show taught us. I do like how Little Pete is written like like an adult mm-hmm. in that he's, you know, he has a vocabulary, like he has angst, he has ambition, like he's a fully developed character. It's just he's not uh, um, currently bombarded by the hormones of puberty yet and thus is more clear headed than a teenager. Right, right. And we can see, I guess, sort of his future trajectory in Artie, right? Yeah. Artie is a character who is unimpacted by hormones, as it is mentioned a, a scene after the Pete hormone scene comes up. So I'm assuming that there that he is that he is planning to go the route of Artie and never and never be impacted by hormones. I'm gonna point out that Lil Pete says Artie is puberty proof. I think that just means Artie is an adult. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's oh, true. Oh, you think so? That's you think true. He just got past it? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you're right, because Artie definitely does get distracted by a beautiful woman at the he bowling does. alley, so he does, have, he, he does have desires. Pete and Ellen have a cute little conversation where Ellen's oh, like, so cute. thanks for saving my life, and uh, Big Pete mumbles on about how his suit is uh, bl- blast-proof, it's got, like, new tungsten lining or whatever, and uh, Ellen gives him a little kiss on the faceplate of his suit completely protected from any cooties uh I, that, that was one of the cutest scenes i think i've ever seen in pete and pete like yeah. just them laying by their side shot reverse shot uh through the yeah through the hazmat plexiglass mm-hmm. that is like wes anderson eat your heart out yeah uh adorable whimsy chad it's fun that you bring that up because eh, i was i was considering that because we did watch another episode of this show uh for goose buds which was the range boy episode an older pete mm-hmm. an old pete episode and mm-hmm. i felt and i agree with you i do think that shot has that same wes anderson quality of which we found a lot of quality and qualities and shots in the Range Boy episode. But I felt that this episode was far more kinetic and a little more, 
I think when you mm. when you're when you're doing an episode from the perspective of young Pete, and maybe it's just the not they haven't fully formulated their style yet, and maybe that's why it's a little more kinetic and a little more fast paced. But I felt like there were less Wes Anderson style blockings and framings of scenes in this one, and a lot more of like quick pans, push ins with the camera, uh, you know, uh, quick actions and things like that, and a lot more of like uh, just just general like a generally more kinetic feeling to this episode. I do agree though that that, that shot felt very Wes Andersony. Yeah, I I think um, the other thing that makes this feel a little more actiony than uh, Range Boy is the fact that this is really like three or four stories yeah. presented almost anthology style. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh it, if I was trying to like pitch a, you know, a magical realism show for kids to Nickelodeon like being like here's like three stories we could do. Like that's a pretty good way to do it. So, I, yeah. I also appreciate that. This is the point where Big Pete kind of exits the story as well. Yep. Well, puberty got him. Yeah. Well, Pete says I d- I didn't blame him, I blamed his clans. Such a great line. So many great, <laughs> great lines in this. And following up another great line, he has a run in with uh with Crosswalk Frank. Yeah, he uh, does the Akira motorcycle stop. He does the stop, which is <laughs> oh incredible. <my> God. <laughs> <laughs> he, it's it's a that's again Put that in the montage you always always do on the internet of like everyone else that does that shot. Put that in Pete. Uh-huh. Pete. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great and that's another that's another moment that I felt like again, it felt very kinetic. It felt very uh mm. I don't know, it just felt a little Whereas as I think Wes Anderson stuff feels staged. You know what I mean? Like yes. feels like feels like more of a yes. staged thing happening. This feels like a more kinetic, almost more nineties MTV esque style to it. And I think that shot is a perfect example of that. This feels more student filmy where they're where and not like college student filmy, like high school student filmy, where like you're playing with the very basic aspects of what film can do and having fun with it. Because that uh motor that uh, Akira stop is just sped up footage right and you can tell that it's like Mm -hmm. that it's going it's just slow down footage that's sped up yep this the show also has this episode has the uh the kinetic bike that i made a note of i wonder this was the bike from the title sequence they always have a shot kind of without any context Mm. in the title sequence of just a bike flying through the air Mm -hmm. as as polaris the band is jamming out and it's a very like oh my god where's that bike going Mm -hmm. uh and I, I wonder, unless that's a shot used somewhere else, this is the the bike from this episode where Pete, early on, frustrated with New Year's, just sends his bike careening down a path of chaos, an endless, an endless ride that we won't see until the end of the episode right. in a way that I love. Right, right. The the bike is an interesting bit of symbolism because it's just like a clock for the episode. Mm-hmm. Little Pete like uh, pushes the bike down the hill at the start of the episode and it just kind of keeps going and going and it's like is is Pete gonna wreck all of his freedom because right. he couldn't get like the most freedom or right yeah mm-hmm. it's the uh it's the Hitchcock bomb ticking under the yeah. table right <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's Chekhov's bomb should we talk about the yeah should we talk about the so yeah you're right Kevin you, this is kind of sh- most of this is short stories on how Pete tried to get this get the jetpack and people let him down in different ways. Yeah. So big, big brother Pete hormones, but now he could turn to Artie. Real quick, I did, I did have a point that I wanted to say. But Crosswalk Frank uh, gets in, involved in a little bit of uh, trash talking with Pete when they have their first true run in in this episode, uh, yep. and yep. he says this line that I thought was incredible. That sounds very dirty, which is scrape me sideways, pip squeak, which what does that <laughs> yeah. mean? Yeah. What does that scrape mean? Scrape me sideways is amazing clean filth, and I love it. Yeah. Even little Pete's like, not bad. Yeah. Pretty good. Yeah. Pete's impressed by this. Well, that's what that's that's the start of their friendship. Right. right? It's the yeah. first um, it's the first peek through of the system of of the system of oppression that Pete views all around him and going, hold on. Maybe there's a, a little humanity inside of that system that I didn't know about that I don't appreciate properly yet. Mm. And th- and then we get an amazing shot of uh, Artie riding riding behind Pete on the kid bike. Mm-hmm. God, I love I love Artie in this. Artie's uh, such a fantastic character. It, it, it's funny that it completely. I think that my cynical version goes like, well, no parent would ever let a kid hang on a doll. Like that's that's two thousand twenty Chad mm-hmm. view. But like Artie is impervious to it. Artie is just a force. For good, 
I never worry about him hanging around with with little Pete. His parents never worry about hanging out with this mm -hmm. this weird man who who dresses in spandex and is constantly flexing. Artie is the best, and he can throw a newspaper so hard it it catches on fire as it impacts a man's <laughs> and, chest and hits a man who is Big Pussy Bumpin' Sarah from The Sopranos. <laughs> Is that oh, really? is that him there too? Because because he shows up in the end of the sequence. Is he in both parts? Yes, he has both parts of that. I don't think he's supposed to be the same character, but I thought it was really funny that he is. <laughs> Maybe he's the same character. Maybe that's what got uh, Artie on his radar, uh, is getting hit with the newspaper. But yes, they are delivering newspapers. And Pete thinks, I got this, and I got this literally in the bag with my paper route, because I'll just go around with Artie, and Artie's power will send these things flying, and doing this paper route is going to be no big thing. Hey, Little Pete, I totally felt that same way about a paper route, and then I was uh, enslaved by capitalism at an early age and was not able to escape. So I get it. Yeah, also you might be asking, why doesn't Artie just help out Pete? Give him some money. Because we discover in this episode that Artie lives in a Porto John. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's right. Yes, I totally forgot about that little detail. That is both worrisome and, and magical. A it, little Porto John a in Lodi, New Jersey, the home of the Misfits. I think it's implied that the Porta John is bigger on the inside, like the TARDIS. Yes. Oh, it's, a, it's definitely a Doctor Who thing where the, yeah. the Porta John can teleport wherever Artie is needed, for sure. <laughs> right. Uh, we also... So when when Artie throws the uh, newspaper, Lil Pete gets the idea that he can make money by betting on a bowling game um, that his dad is uh, participating in. Uh, they need a sub. So he puts Artie in. Artie, and you'd think that would be enough because Artie's the strongest man in the world. But no. Yeah. <laughs> Artie has a uh, bowling ball with a hamster in it that he controls telepathically so he can always get a strike. Yeah, how'd you guys feel about that bowling ball? I, uh, I love it. I thought that the sit shot, first shot where he throws it and then uses the telepathy was awesome. How the color, they use the color light changing on his face to, to signify him entering the telepathic mind sphere. <laughs> him using the shining. Yes. I love that shot so much. I, I, I first was like, Artie, that's cheating. And then as soon as he had to, as soon as you're like, oh, well, he has to communicate with the, the hamster via telepathy. Mm. I'm like, okay, well, Artie's using a skill still. He is it's still okay. using a skill that he has uh, seemingly honed. There's a lot of gray morality in this. Like, like the landmine uh, scam is them like cheating old sure. women out of their money. <laughs> it's uh, kind of a mobster protection racket, right? It is. Like, yes. Kinda... <laughs> yes. And and this is and I, what I think is funny. What the end result of this sequence is is ultimately uh, like someone being hired to play baseball on a team knowingly uh, while they are using steroids. Basically, mm -hmm. is essentially mm -hmm. what we're seeing here. But this, I think, the fun thing about this, right, is Pete. Pete doesn't have like Pete isn't like a good moral character. Like he wants to save the world. Right. But yeah. he'll do it at any with within any means possible to him. It doesn't matter if he's, if he's breaking the rules because the world is already so screwed up that he's going to work within the frameworks that he, that of the world that he's already in. Right. Yeah. The, the, the whole theme of the ends don't justify the means is really subtly done here in, in a way that is palatable. Right. I feel because rather than have Pete, like, you know, take a drag from a candy cigarette and say the ends don't justify the means. He's just like, this year sucked. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Great gag when are they first come in there and Artie runs up to the uh, little hand cooling vent on the bowling machine and I... <laughs> and says, ah, free air. <laughs> that one got me. I cackled for free air. Free air. Is, uh, uh, I love I love that. He's fantastic. I love when he's just lying on his back looking at the uh, the bowling ball with a hamster in it and says, how's it going in there, fatty? Uh -huh. <laughs> I I also enjoyed when in the montage of Artie being a su not surprisingly fantastic bowler, mm. uh, at some point he just lays across the like overhead projector for the bowling scores uh -huh. and just Spits. and just coughs up phlegm. <laughs> yeah. It's like he's like a he's like a golden retriever. That one's for the kids. Uh, that's for the, that's for the kids to make them laugh so they can go ha ha spit. Yeah. Ha. <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh interesting complexity to already here uh he's, I, I do also want to make tickled yeah he's it's it, it, uh, he's wonderful and i think that one thing that we should note too and i've always said this i think that uh bowling is the perfect sport for movies it's a uh, name a bad bowling movie you know what i mean 
Oh, they're all good. Uh, I know Kingpin and great. That's it. Great movie. Alley Cat Strike. All good. All good <laughs> stuff. Uh, the Bowler in in Mystery Men's pretty cool. Oh mm-hmm. wow, Chad brought up Mystery Men for I can bring up Mystery Men. <laughs> I am having an effect on you guys. <laughs> You guys want to go bowling sometime? Yes, bowling. bowling is yeah, so much bowling. fun. Let's go bowling. And I think it looks great for film because it has a really symmetrical look. There's a lot of great shot, long, uh, exciting shots you can get down the lane. Uh, Big Lebowski. Big Lebowski, great, Sorry. great bowling movie. Makes a good date, too. It does make a good date. You really show off yeah. your butt when you're throwing a ball. Show off your butt, and if you <laughs> if you're not good at it, it's okay as long as you as long as you laugh about it. You can show that you're you're like you got some humility about you. You know, it's a yeah. great it's a great thing. Just don't put the bumpers up on the date. Just don't do it. Unless you're both there for a good time. Bumpers are fun. And also DDR is fun. Bowling alleys, can't wait to come back to you. I love them. <laughs> I, th- I just think that bowling makes for a really good, I just make really good visuals. Uh, I love the Dick Dale-esque song going underneath this the entire time. We got some great surf rock mm-hmm. happening. And le- as we said, some really great shots of, uh, of telepathy being used on a hamster. Uh, but... Kevin, you were about to ca- to carry on the story. What happens here? Oh, uh, uh, Artie gets scouted by a pro bowl scout. <laughs> Last frame. Last frame of the night, right before yep. he could bowl. Mm-hmm. Uh, swoops in. Yep. Uh, and that is, what is his name? His name is Big Pussy Paul? In, is that what in, you said? In The Sopranos, his character's name is Big Pussy Bumpin' Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Pete's dad's team uh, loses the game. Pete, I, I I guess loses his money in the bet, um, and what's worse, uh, he also loses Artie, who is now whisked away to places such as Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, and Belasky, Missouri, oh, or Belasky, Missouri. It. Oh, and I love the detail that to add insult to injury, now on his paper route, he has to lug around some sort of deluxe bowling news edition that is uh-huh. just carrying news <laughs> about Artie's and Artie's successes across the country. It's the perfect representation of him trying to utilize capitalism to his advantage or utilize, you know, money mm-hmm. and capital uh to his advantage and then someone with greater wealth coming in and then destroy and 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 swiping <laughs> in and stealing it from him it's great because yeah. it happens both with the with the player and then the football the the route is ruined by it as well it's great this brings us into uh i guess our final standalone story mm-hmm. uh which is the the crosswalk story so we yeah. return to frank uh where we have the crosswalk standoff where uh Frank doesn't budge, and neither does Pete. Uh, <laughs> they have a night where they just sort of stand at the crosswalk, trading insults. Uh, Will Pete tries to intimidate uh, Frank by saying, Do you know there are 22 ways you can kill a man? To which he responds, 23, and holds up an ice cream scoop. <laughs> Love it. Or a cookie scoop, whatever it is. You know... Sometimes when you're trying to make a story, you can overthink things and you're like, I can't just throw in this little bit here. Like, it doesn't make sense in the larger context of the story. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's totally worth it just to throw in a little standalone bit that's funny. Yeah, this is it's a little like it almost comes off a little bit lol random, you know? Yeah. Like, and uh, this show is can be, I would uh, I would argue, uh, like a little bit lol random at times, but arguably maybe the beginning of that whole like type of humor right like there's prob this is probably the the part of the genesis of that type of humor but moments like this work i think because of the amount of heart and and uh obvious pa- passion that are poured into the story and filmmaking in this show mm-hmm. and it's also a good way to show um frank as an equal to pete like they hate each other but by the end of it they sort of establish a friendship and then ruin that friendship and then sort of come back together again right yeah it's it's genuinely tragic that he he loses frank's uh you know seal of approval yeah he he he, he, he corrupted something beautiful and charged people money they for fit the the story of like a romantic comedy into about five minutes the, yeah. the story beats of a romantic comedy into about five minutes so uh pete wins the standoff uh because uh he tricks Frank into putting down the sign so Frank can tell him the story of why he became a crossing guard. Pete gets to walk away because the magic sign is no longer up. Right. Uh, and he he walks away, the victor of the standoff, and then feels bad and goes and sits with um with Frank, who says that uh 
one one time when he was working the crosswalk 11 years ago uh a cat mr boots wasted on cat <laughs> <laughs> uh didn't look both ways before crossing the street and was almost hit by a car because frank was on a smoke break so and, and thus and then he he smokes a cigarette and yep. they're not they're making it look not cool because one he's not a cool character right two his teeth are pretty bad his teeth are pretty bad and he and he openly admits that smoking almost caused uh the death of one of his of one of his charges as crossing guard thus mm-hmm. making smoking the ultimate villain in his life and why he wants to kick it yeah yeah smoking isn't cool but frank's like can like commitment and conviction is admirable right uh, i also just i just, I just want to talk about how much i just not to go too far away from it i just loved the visual of how many extras they paid for oh that my shot God. of Pete holding up, uh, little Pete holding up uh, the cross guard charging $20, and you see an angry old man who who cannot resist the force field of the stop, yep. and everyone is just paying in 20 bucks. There's probably like, like 50 to 100 extras all lined up on this very quiet city block just trying to get across the street. It is... Adorable. They got everyone that was working production that day that wasn't an, yeah. a part of the actual current shoot to get over there and, and just to get in line. It was great. Yeah. So Pete takes the oath to be a crossing guard. Uh, as soon as Frank falls asleep, he charges people twenty dollars to like cross. Mm-hmm. One of the people in line gets a <laughs> get gets a wild hair of their ass and decides to try and run around. A sinister Draco Malfoy's dad man, who you know is evil because he's wearing all black and he's got an umbrella when it's not raining. He has out. he has nineties day trader look for sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I love this one bit character. He's got he's just like he has no lines, but he's playing this like delicious Jay Walker mm-hmm. part. So yeah, well. he's like he's running like Jack Skellington uh-huh. yards to evade to evade to cut I around. I love that heroic shot of him jumping the fence with the low, the extreme low angle, and he's just mm-hmm. like he like uh, uh he like Olympically leaps over it, like both legs splayed yeah. out. Ah, oh, so good. I, and I think it's interesting that when Pete apprehends this uh this character, that's when uh Frank. Uh, makes like kicks him out of the crossing guards because he says you let me down you abandon your post he doesn't care about the money he doesn't really care that all he cares about is he abandoned his post and thus the crosswalk wasn't safe like i assume the money is also not great though well i, mean, I, I agree with you kevin more than it was abandoning your post but i agree the money is probably an ethical thing yeah he wouldn't have been happy about that however i think he kind of knew what he was getting into when he hired pete but <laughs> he did expect him to stay at the post that's yeah that the, yeah I think it's ultimately that was what they're both working again within this this system right and that now now Pete knows that this one purveyor of of lack of freedom on his life right like his mm-hmm. his one freedom is the bike right that's the one freedom he does have and he throws it away at the beginning because he feels like he he's out of control uh this this character has always been an impediment right someone that stops mm-hmm. him and his freedom and, ha- and makes him stay there briefly and holds him up but now he's been through the Mr. Boots story, led into the fact that this is just another human on this planet trying to make make ends meet. And and he has a code that he upholds, right? Yeah. He ultimately, he might be working within a system that is oppressive, but he's trying to use that system in as best as he can to make people around him safer. And I think to your point, Kevin, this him betraying ultimately what matters to him the most about this, which is protecting people is the biggest aspect but chad i do agree there is something to about him taking advantage of it as well which i think again is another instance of the capitalism and in, already inside of the, the the little gnawing thing inside of pete where he needs to buy the the jet pack that, that's been planted in his head so that he can fix himself and fix the world that has infected each aspect right of his plan and and here's the thing about uh crossing guard frank is that I don't think he's a cop. There are many like elements of his portrayal that sort of suggest he's a cop, mm-hmm. but he's really more of like a bureaucrat. I feel. He's yeah, a, I think he's like a civil servant. Is how yeah, I say it. right. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. He's he's definitely painted as cop the first time you you run into him for sure. Like you're getting yeah. you're getting cop vibes, but then at like I, like you said, like as he's slowly revealed and like his character is painted out a little bit more. You start to see that he he has this he has a he has a moral code that he's sticking by. 
Yeah. It, you know, what would society be without rules and what would society be without people questioning those rules is sort of the Frank Pete, uh, like dynamic. Right. At the end of the, the crosswalk grift, it doesn't matter, uh, what, what happens to Frank as far as Pete's concerned because he's got enough money, uh, to buy that jetpack now. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he, he sends away for it. He wait and he waits, uh, I think six weeks to get it. Uh, and, I think uh, December 21st is when it arrives. And when he gets it, it's a leaf blower. He's been lied to. Capitalism has lied to him. Yeah, I, I thought that was in, I thought it was interesting. Also, let's let's not completely skip over the a fantastic shot from Pete's upstairs window of the mailman coming and Pete going like, I was maybe a little excited. Pete just like, they had that kid full on like football tackle that old man and knock him into the trash and take the package and run away. That was a very funny image. I, I love the, I love the trash padding to absorb the uh-huh. blood of the oh, tackle. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it was great. It's and a natural stuntman's tool is yep. the pile of trash. Yep. I remember as a kid being so fucking furious that uh, Pete got a leaf blower instead of a jetpack because I really wanted him to get yeah. the jetpack. He, I believe he says that it was a mistake. Yeah. And I wondered if it genuinely was, oh, he would have gotten a jetpack, or are we as older people going, yeah, the whole thing was a scam. They just sent him a I think lower. that's it, right? We know that those things, the sea monkeys and the x-ray glasses, right? We know that all those things were always scams, right? Those are capitalist yeah. scams because they were just, you know, making promises, snake oil salesmen in the back of a comic book. Um, you know, making their making their sales. And I think mm-hmm. like that's what's interesting about Pete's progression through this story is like in the beginning, he's got his idyllic innocence and he's like, well, we can make this change. I'm going to work with my best friend and we're going to go out and we're going to make the change. We're going to we're going to raise money and I'm going to and I'm going to get this thing. and I'm going to change the world. And then the just the loss of natural loss of childhood ruins it for him. Right. Like yeah. just like the actual act of, of years passing by ruins it. That loses it for him the first time. Then he meet, he gets up, gets together with his other friend, which is seemingly in his teen years, who's already gone through puberty, right? Mm. And it's like, oh well, we'll you know we'll do this thing. We'll become you'll become a great you know a bowl. You will use bowling and like you, you use your your athletic ability, and we'll take advantage of that, and we'll use that to make a change, right? And then someone with more money comes in and steals that from him by like capitalizing mm-hmm. on it before he can, and he loses that. Then, as we talked about. He's like, oh, well, then I will, you know, work with this. I'll, I'll, I'll just take the system that's oppressing me and I'll bend it to my will. Right. And then he does that and then is is successful. And but in doing that has kind of gone against, you know, like the code that he uh, not that he had a code, but it's kind of well, he had to betray someone. He had to betray had someone. To, yes. He, he had to do something that he acknowledges is like mean like taking money from people that's part of the game right hurting someone's feelings yeah. like y- you could tell that's not part of the the game of capitalism but right. it's what he had to do right he's truly to... corrupted by it he is corrupted yeah. and he's and he knows he's corrupted but he feels that ultimately these will ends will justify the means he buys it and then the actual machine of capitalism screws him over directly right mm-hmm. And then that's when he's left at his lowest point when he realizes he has no recourse. And he says, life is a bumpy, out of control ride to nowhere. An incredible (laughs) line. He also says, that's when I knew New Year's resolutions were a joke. For one night, you get all wiggly thinking about changing everything. And in the end, you're just a feeb. Yep. And (laughs) I love what a light this shines on New Year's Eve as a holiday and Mm -hmm. how we all treat it. Right. Because it's a really selfish holiday. It's mm-hmm. not about thinking mm-hmm. about how other people's years have gone. It's about thinking about how you can improve yourself. Mm-hmm. But everyone thinks selfishly about how they can improve themselves. They don't think how they can help someone else, which is often easier than trying to improve yourself in a way that you'll find meaningful. Right. I think it's interesting that he has these large scale a- aspirations for change. And mm-hmm. and and to your point, Kevin, he sees all the adults around him trying to make themselves better, right? Trying to fix a little thing about themselves, um, you know, because yeah. they but because they're so in the ruts of their lives, right? They're so in the like they but they've been around this this star uh, so many more times, you know, yeah. like they've yeah. they've gone around, so like they're not they're well past the point of feeling like they can make any big 
macro level changes to the world so that they're so in their little worlds that they're they're trying to just make the tiniest little change and that's so hard for them and he sees that right and Mm -hmm. but this is this story is a way of like bashing it into pete's head that this shit is really really hard and you you can't always make the big macro level change that you want to do and he makes the, the he makes the decision that hey i can't do that but what i can do is i can start with one person crossing crossing yeah. guard frank right i can yeah he says i i can't make the world a better place for all mankind but i can make it better for frank for like, frank i can make the world a better place it's for fantastic mm-hmm. I, I just just the going to frank who is there at the crosswalk at 11 mm-hmm. 11 30 plus p.m mm-hmm. while everyone else is partying frank is holding the line out of noble duty yep catching the runaway bike is such a great like frank is still there yep frank, yeah frank perseveres he's there so nothing happens to the next mr boots yep the fact that like pete shows up and and just connects with him and like i don't think he does much more than wish him a happy new year's right like it's it's really just yeah. kind of a sweet tender moment yeah he, ha- he wishes him a happy new year and then uh, kevin i think you already mentioned this line or chad you might have mentioned it but he says you know frank asks him like all right you know like you know how was your year? Like, you know, what do you think? How do you, how did you do? And he says, it was a terrible year, <laughs> but I got a new one and I'll figure something out. Just thus proving that like, he's kind of put into perspective, like, Hey, I can make these little changes, but I'm not giving up my uh, idealism just yet. There's still time yeah. for me to maybe figure out how to make this work. Yeah. And after, you know, two terrible years <laughs> or maybe like six terrible years or how many terrible years you want to count mm-hmm. uh, in this, uh, on this earth and in this country, that line hit pretty hard for me. Yeah. Yeah, man. Well, we do this like we we still do this, right? I feel like there's maybe maybe this is the year we'll grow out of it. But yeah. the last couple of years, the the hot internet take is always the next couple of weeks. You just go, wow, 20, 2020 sucked. Can't wait for 2021. Like, yeah, like as if as if January 31st somehow actually means that the world will stop burning in any way. It's like we all want there to be a reset button, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I think we know it's it's not going to be any different. That first week of, man, first week of January 2021 was pretty fucking wild. Uh-huh. Yep. <laughs> and, and that was start, that was starting it off. I, I, I wonder if there's something about still in the face of nihilism, having a little bit of hope is, is cool. I, I appreciate it. Yeah. And it's important to keep that hope. It's important to have these little rituals like uh, New Year's Eve. And uh, it never stops being um, disappointing when we can't live up to who we want to be. But it's also important to take stock of, like, you know, how far we've actually come in the last year, mm-hmm. even if it wasn't as far as you wanted it to be. Right. There, there's a there's a really tiny little detail I appreciated, and and it's the perfect level of it. Where after, you know, little Pete's showing up to Frank and he's and he's stolen an old man's celebration horn to mm. to play with him. Frank does pull out a cigarette and he pulls it and he pulls a, 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 a puff out of it. But without making a big moment out of it, Frank just has this kind of like tiny little moment of pause and then throws the cigarette away mm. and then proceeds to just enjoy riding the bike around. I, I don't want to I don't want to poo poo on that. And I do agree that that was I, I took note of that as well. But before I. We started this episode. I began the episode again to watch it just to kind of refresh some stuff in my mind. And in the beginning of the episode, he na- he says, this is the last cigarette I'm going to have. And he does. <laughs> oh, yeah. He does the exact same thing where he takes the first drag and then throws it. So I, I'm a little wary to be like, <laughs> is he just repeating that cycle again? You know what I mean? Oh, uh, no. I, no, totally. I Because I, I think the step too far would have been. If Pete showing up had gotten him to quit smoking, uh-huh. that'd be crazy. Right. Like, it's one of the hardest things to break. It's, yeah. a, it's a terrible heart addiction. And it's very likely that Frank will continue to smoke. Right. But in that moment of New Year's Eve with Pete, Frank stops. Mm-hmm. Like, gives himself a moment of hope. I think that's really cool. Yep. At that moment, anything is possible because it's a new year. It's the Calvin and Hobbes, let's go sledding. Yep. Oh, oh, get all, get all, oh, get all sappy. <laughs> I love this episode. It's another great Pete and Pete episode. 
Yeah, it's got so many other bits hidden in there. I think mm. I always forgot this was the bowling episode. This, yep. The stuff with the jetpack had been had been burned in my memory. Mm -hmm. Like, didn't realize it was all nestled here and Pete talking about his previous year. Yeah, I know TV executives are horrible beasts from the pits mm -hmm. of hell. But how do you mm -hmm. watch this episode and not go like, I'll take a season? <laughs> Well, they did, though, right? Well, they right? did, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, like, it, it worked. And I think they saw the they saw the promise in it. But, yeah. I, you know, like, I, maybe maybe it uh, maybe it made too good a point, Kevin. <laughs> By the way, if you want to go, I looked it up, if you want to go bowling in the same place, uh, it looks like, unless they've changed the name and moved, Ooh. Lodi Lanes, which is thanked to the end credits, is still in New Jersey. Wow. Uh Obviously, some updated bowling art since the 90s. But if you want to get some of the same free air that Artie, Artie inhaled, they're there, in, they're there in New Jersey. What a pilgrimage. So do they, do they film in Lodi, New Jersey? I think we might have talked about where they filmed before. And they have to because there's a lot of thanks in the previous credits of like the people of New Jersey. And I think it huh. even says film location. They definitely yeah. filmed in New Jersey. I know that. But I I just didn't know if they filmed in Lodi. Because again, like I said, uh, I know Lodi, New Jersey from uh, the, that's where uh, the the Misfits began there. There. Oh, that's right. Their yeah. Careers, so. Huh. Uh, so this is Ken Chris, a special thanks town of Leonia, New Jersey. Um, I don't know if that's hmm. close or far away from there. I don't know. Paul? Uh, pff, I don't know. <laughs> Who can say? Who could say? There's really no way for us to find out. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that's been an episode of Goosebuds. Unless y'all got any other thoughts on, on Pete and Pete? I love it. I, I just wanted to do a little bit of context. I think our first Pete and Pete episode was a year ago uh, when I was a guest on the show. We watched Oh Christmas Pete. That's right, yeah. Right. That was a very fun memory for me, because I was very sleep-deprived, but it was, it was a good episode to record. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I, I know that um, it might seem strange for this show in particular to uh, review Pete and Pete episodes, uh, since we normally do uh, young adult horror content from the 90s, but I find doing these episodes occasionally and we weren't, we're not going to become a Pete and Pete podcast, but I find doing nope. these just sort of like recalibrates me on like what actually good kid literature was like. And I do consider Pete sure. and Pete literature. A good story. A good yeah. story for, for, for people. Yeah. It's totally. a show that chooses not to condescend in any way. Right. Yeah. Like it, they, ultimately like they, they make every decision they make is because they think it's the funny idea. They think it's the good idea. And it, it, it like, they don't care about there is the little randomish type stuff, right? But mm -hmm. I don't think that that's there because they're like, well, this is we need to make the kids laugh here, you know. But let he who is not lulled cast the first stone. Agree. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I think I think that I think the show yeah is a great like you said uh, a great uh, recalibrator um, and a great example of of you know what children deserve in their media if they're gonna if they're if yeah. we're gonna make stuff for them yeah yeah all, all people deserve shows like pete and pete mm -hmm. I, I just love pete and pete so much and i love uh i love talking about it with you guys because it's just it's just nice for us to be all on the same page gushing about a a thing we really really like <laughs> it's it's refreshing for sure i i am very thankful to get to do this show with you all um it, it's been a hell of a year yeah. Not to make this too much of a New Year's episode. But yeah, it, it's been a crazy 2021. Uh, very thankful to get to talk about weird stories with you all. You you, you boys are my my brothers, my friends. You make me laugh. And thank you all for listening to this. this yeah. Really cool. And thanks uh, for uh, my first year as a Goosebuds host. Hey. Yeah. You did it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you everybody and i love you guys you too i love all our listeners but i love you too very much uh -huh. and may endless mike never find you <laughs> <laughs> if you want to check out more of this show and you want to support it at the same time you can go to patreon.com slash goosebuds we have dozens upon dozens of bonus camp goosebuds episodes where we hang out on the campfire and and chew the fat and and bond over things uh, and also your support keeps the show going and the lights on. Uh, we really appreciate it. Yeah. Go play some games. Go play go some play fun some, video games. Go play some games. Eat a Dorito, but not because the advertising told you to. Eat it because <laughs> it's a fun corn snack. <laughs>
but then wash your hands before you touch your game controllers. Oh my god, don't get dirty. Please, <laughs> please wash your hands. <laughs> wash oh them! <laughs> <laughs> Until next time. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Ho, 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 <laughs> Merry Names, Miss. It's me, Kevin Claus, and my wonderful elves, and we're opening a big bag of names for all the good children. Santa Kevin? Santa Kevin, Santa Kevin, tell us all the good boys and ghouls that have been in the in the book of names. Yeah, let me read them. Uh, the, 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 let's start with <laughs> Stefan Jive Turkey Kuwabara. <laughs> Hollis Hornbeak. Cameron Murphy Audio. Michael McDowell. Josh Robertson. Mickey C. Nathan Dolezal. Kelly C. Mike Lanteri. Buddy Morrill. Ale Cade. Mel Dipson. Zankeith. Af Sheen. Danky McStanky. Dango Twiss. Brian Wells. Zentacles. Low Belly Hate Me. Stealth. Bates. Joseph Miranda. Patrick Reynolds. Robert Moon. Jason Crooker. John Keedy. Clay Castle. Miguel Pardo. Christina Doling. Third, Sergio. Calf. Matthew, more paranoia shop. <laughs> Sniggy. Maddie. Ishak Arafin. Gregory D. Warren. Alan Saylor. Cody Redfield. Bradford Coulter. Aiden Alexander Dice. Reinfected. Jar Jar Slinks. Justin Wagman. Chosen One. Cardboard Walk. Levi Than. Up and Champ. Jonas Engman. Alicia Grafe. Moister. Carl. Hey, Broccoli. Pause for a second. I think I get something off my chest. I love Paul. <gasps> Still love you too, Broccoli. The John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Can't believe we got them. <laughs> Big guy. They've really been in our corner. Elusive Koala. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yanni Markovina. Trent Davis. Joe. Can't believe we got Joe. We can't believe we got Joe. Big. Brook X. Beezus Christ. Christian Vanskiver. Drew Applegate. Jeremy Lowe. Brian Hobgood. Jonas Blotterman. Zach Connor. Patreon underscore donator comma yo. Joe Spooky Digital Ghost Tierney. Tom Woodham. Paul Grasso. Andrew Jadsack forgot the MO question for Lord Cornwallis, but <laughs> does hope Chili Dish Gambino includes corn and goes light on the cumin. <laughs> still with I'm that. Pretty sure that's how you wanted me to say that last word. Andrew, still well, with the anti cumin propaganda. <laughs> we, we have opposite goals for our chili construction because I go no corn, heavy cumin. Heavy, heavy cumin. We Andrew and I have discussed oh. this. It's okay. Andrew. I am a pro corn. I'm on the pro corn side. Corn's you in would everything. Be. You would be Indiana, <laughs> yes, boy. it should be. We got to keep Indiana going. <laughs> Corn is delicious. Speaking yep. of, speaking of corn. Oh, speaking of, Lord <laughs> speaking Corn of. Wallace. <laughs> Taylor Dierks. Joe regular name scott i sense that anger too chad <laughs> <laughs> carson birkenbean <laughs> murphy p trendy moron devin ticklebean is your new best friend fuck yeah gunk hoots vincent modica luke canoodles snes chalmers sean minogue hugh bolin zambambino worm town glenn Wiggle it! John Pigeon Hat Barber. Chip Handsome. <laughs> Matt McClellan. Alex Moon, the robotic dog. Nathan Remick. Sarah Kemp. Divaldi. Tanya Turtle. Chili Dish Gambino with just enough cumin. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> Brett. Reed Stupid Dick. Joey Evans. Adam, you goofed. Juan Jalapena. Carewise Gamgee. Uncle Cool Brother. Cameron Hansen. Keith Halcrow. Chris Tranquil Sleepwear Erection. Nelson. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> Timothy Misodilakis. Clay McCarty. Matthew Stevens. Parker Lee. Generally depressing. Dom's Sexy Ghost, a.k.a. Captain Sick. Ham underscore boat. Hey, Polly, it's me, <laughs> Benny Guess Your Weight, the Spooky Dune Witch. Anyway, go on and put your hand in my boo box. <laughs> this is like a fucking Mad Magazine version of Dune. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs>
Paula try these. Um, ben <laughs> Bohan. <laughs> Raven Hernandez. I just gotta take a quick second to say we all missed a calling at Reading at Man Magazine. God damn it. Me too. <laughs> Flemily did as well. The Crow Fens. Matthew Sutton. Jeffrey Owen Cahy. Dan. Boss Gerritsen. Lee Wood. Hey, Eric, it's gonna be all right. You're doing a great job. But go easy on the Kuman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, it's me. Kelsey hey, Kinnaman. You got it. When Dragons Rule. Russell Kastberg. Yes. Nice. <laughs> Xavier Jimenez, Brendan Arafin, Liam Neeson's Doe. Welcome to the Discord, Liam Neeson's. Yeah, we yeah we saw you get on the we saw you get on the Discord, Liam Neeson's Doe. We saw it. Crispy Trickus, Scotty Pippen, get on there, Scotty. We need you. We need you for the pickup <laughs> Scotty, game. Scotty, we need the triangle offense. Come on. <laughs> You're dying out there, Scotty. <laughs> Jonas Evan Voldson, Calamity Carl, Germ Juice, Streak, Meat Virginia, Nick Johnson, Dungeon Kappa. Stephen Day. Uh, MC Hamster. <laughs> Zach Weir. Lip Duck. Alan G. Jessum. Tobias Clark. Michael Kupka. Julianne Lamendia. Ryan Car- I'm sorry. <laughs> Adam Muth. Ryan Carroll. Andre Villanueva. Jeremy Bowser. Megan McCormick Mason. Ninja Breadman. Hood Lemon. Got little moi pretty French. Oh, ho, ho. Peanutburg, level 69. <gasps> Dr. Chocula. Jimmy Soul. Estamina, Lord of Paul's Pants. The Davy Boy. Kenny M. Moon Juice. Dr. Diarrhea. Kieran McNamara. Diet Soda. Skelefella. Jackie Ledoux. Coleman Laguza. Lamb Mrs. Hearing. Chris Pittman Aww. is a bone wizard. Aww. Aww. Me too. What a good guilt trip to, to change your name. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, SSJ Trogdor. A pair of Scots. Levi Kidder. David Gray. Bryce Diori. Matthew Brattato. I am Cornholio. I need TP for my bunghole. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Spaghetti. Jones. Carbson. Redemption. Luke Humanzi Allen. Some of Chad's bird friends. Ah, cool. Oh, Nicholas Maloney. Chris. <laughs> Midwest Indigo 13. <laughs> David Lynch, XXX, Brandon Frazier, 666. Eric. A crossover. Horwitz. Tiffany Lee, or Tiffany Leia. Dr. Eggdrop Soupman. Thomas Jancis. Lucretia McEvil. Elm Realm. Mutant Astronauts. Wagmar Wigmer. Nice. Dakota Kemp. John W. Soggy Newspapers. Alec Johnson. Henry Torber. The Skotag. Adam Knapp. Burger's Wonderful World. Kiwi of Lerv. <laughs> Bjorn Deer. We've been saying that yeah. Kiwi of Flerv. I've been saying that Kiwi of Flerv, but you nailed it, Chad. It's Kiwi of Lerv. I think you leaned in on the Lerv. Yeah, it's love. Oh, Kiwi of Lerv. Of Lerv. Yeah. Oh, my. Wow. Let us know, Kiwi. Make sure that, tell me that I did a good job. I, I think you <laughs> fucking nailed it. <laughs> Tell me I did good. If you screwed it up, Serial Killer X is coming for <laughs> tell you. Me I'm, tell me I'm good. Tell me I'm good. <laughs> Please, re- reinforce me. Logan Derby. Brad Schmelzer. Gacanti. Milk Punk. <laughs> Skeletorin. Jover the Moon. Shuddering Stefan. Mr. Misfire. Mr. Muffin. <laughs> what? Oh, these two gotta get together. <laughs> Mandy Nasty. Llama Lad. Benjamin Luther. Edgar's not going to cut off your tongues. I promise, Crassies. <laughs> Thanks, Edgar's. Dennis Wright. Jacob Rogers. 976 Evil. Jesse? <laughs> Philip Reynolds? Rum Daddy. Cameron Gansveld. Chicago Frank. Nathan Gurney. Vosivi. Matt? Are these new names? These, these seem like new names. Oh, they're new. Yeah. Oh my goodness, we just accidentally entered names into the into the book of names. Oh shit, new names. All right, uh, nobody panic. Uh, nobody 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 cry. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Retroactively, Chicago Frank, Nathan Gurney and Vosivi, you're in. Welcome. You're in. Welcome. You're fucking you're in. in. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> you're in. Matt Septor, welcome to the book of names. Wait, Greg, Greg Gervasi was here last time, I think. Oh, yeah. I don't know anymore. Well, All Greg, right. Greg, hey, you're back. welcome again. You know what? You're still new to the you're book getting, of names. You're getting welcomed anyway. Daryl Flynn, welcome. Fucking hi, Dakota Kipper. Ryan R. Davis, nice to meet you. Anthony Rodriguez, good to have you. 
Pizza Bagel Rocco. Hope you're sharing those pizza bagels. Scott Wabel, pull up a chair. B. Oh, someone let a B in. Shit. <laughs> oh, wait, welcome. But we're allergic. <laughs> Kit Bush, get your name down on the page in blood. <laughs> Jonathan McAnish, what are you having? Ho, 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 and welcome <laughs> Peter McGregor. Oh, Santa Cole's back. Yeah, oh, I'm Santa back. Cole. I'm These back and my names. thirst for blood has been quenched. Thank you for all <laughs> oh, the names. Oh, thank God. Oh, God. We've survived He's... another year. Thank God. <laughs> thank you all so very, very much. Have a good holidays, y'all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.